So now I'm going to describe in much more detail how this works in a very specific case. So here is a very, the darling of uh, uh, drug, uh, of molecular um, anti-cancer therapy, imatinib, which is an inhibitor of two major kinases, the, the uh, Abelson kinase and the Kit kinase. And here, uh, here is uh, the drug uh, sitting in, a, in the wrapping pattern of the Kit kinase, and here are the uh, backbone hydrogen bonds that the drug is actually wrapping, okay? It's actually contributing with nonpolar groups to keep, to, to stabilize those bonds. And so the inspiration came from this paper, which came in 2006, that said that actually imatinib was cardiotoxic and traced its cardiotoxicity to inhibition of one of its major targets, the Abelson kinase. This brought, of course, pandemonium because uh, all of a sudden it turned out that uh, all this edema that people were seeing uh, in patients treated with imatinib, imatinib is a major drug to treat ca gastro uh, both gastrointestinal stromal tumor and chronic myeloleukemia, so all this edema was not due to the cancer but to the drug itself and actually it ended up creating um, cardiac hypertrophy and, and ultimately uh, a stroke. Uh, and so the idea was, can we really redesign imatinib to curb the side effect, right? So if, if the wrapping technology or the wrapping paradigm is, is going to hold, uh, it's going to be watertight, then it better work in, in, a, in a, we better take up a challenge like this and show that it really works. Or, or else, you know, we just, just live in, in only in the theoretical space. So this is also interesting for, for long-term treatments where, you know, imatinib has been used to treat diabetes, but there, of course, the prolonged treatment uh, makes only things worse. And so it's in our interest to try to curb the cardiotoxicity using the wrapping redesign of the drug. So. This leads us to the second problem uh, uh, when dealing with side effects, which is the context dependence of the target. So here is the Abelson kinase, which in the chronic myeloleukemia cell, progenitor cell, is actually deregulated through some chimeric uh, uh, interaction with the BCR gene. And so this, this kinase is actually uh, constitutively active all the time doesn't stop. And so its inhibition really blocks anti-apoptotic pathways. These are well-known anti-apoptotic pathways transduced originally by the Abelson kinase. And that's exactly what you want, right? You want to block anti-apoptotic pathways because you want, you want this cell to die. You want to, in fact, induce apoptosis. So this is, so, this is exactly what you want to do. And that was the rationale behind uh, imatinib behind the discovery of imatinib but when you go to the heart it's a different story here is a cardiomyocyte and there the inhibition of Abelson kinase actually triggers a, a cascade of phosphorylation events that ultimately leads to mitochondrial depolarization uh, and, uh, and ultimately ATP depletion and you know that the cardiomyocyte cannot operate, cannot afford ATP depletion because it needs ATP more than any other cell in the body is working all the time, right? So, uh, so this, this, this type of stress, of endoplasmatic reticulum stress, ultimately causes the death of the cardiomyocyte. So this is the side effect that we need to address. And in passing, we notice that uh, this cascade of events leads to the phosphorylation of June K. So what if we try to redesign imatinib so that it doesn't touch the Abelson kinase, but in passing, we rather also uh, make it so that it inhibits JUNK, and then we'll be able to protect the heart because the pathway that is actually triggered by this uh, stress uh, would actually be uh, blocked at this stage, and, and then the mitochondria will be preserved. So, 
essentially, if you go to the drawing board, this is what you really want. This is, these are the cross-reactivities of imatinib. These are its targets. And, and this is the therapeutic impact of the drug on the different targets. And you see the kit is related to the, is a major target in treating a solid tumor, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, uh, and perhaps even kit-dependent melanomas, although that's only in phase two trial. Uh, BCR-able kinase is great uh, uh, to treat chronic myeloleukemia as a great target, but as, as shown recently, it produces, it induces cardiotoxicity. And then PDGFR is a platelet-dependent growth factor receptor kinase, which, of course, its inhibition would, would uh, be highly desirable because this is an, an angiogenic factor, so you want to cut the blood supply to the tumor, so it's okay that you inhibit it. This cross-reactivity, in fact, is highly expected because these two are close homologs. Kit and so whenever you touch this, you touch this. LCK, you don't really want to touch LCK. This is a lymphocyte-dependent kinase, and that can, uh, its inhibition can actually produce immunosuppression, suppression, and you don't really want to touch that. So the desired targets would actually be Kit, PDGFR, and JUNK, right? Because we notice that JUNK is on the uh, blocking JUNK can actually have a protective role on the mitochondria of cardiomyocytes. So we compare the wrapping uh, of the primary in, in matinib targets, BCR able and KIT, and we immediately <coughs> notice that there's a difference here in the so-called nucleotide binding loop. So here you have a well-wrapped hydrogen bond in, uh, in Abelson, which becomes a dehydron in KIT when you do the alignment. So that's a major wrapping difference that we may want to take into account when redesigning imatinib to be able to tell apart Kit from Abelson, right? Remember, we want to avoid cardiotoxicity. We want to create a new version of imatinib that is not cardiotoxic. Same is true about LCK. Same story. So Kit has a dehydron there, LCK has a well-wrapped hydrogen bond, so what if I modify this terminal ring of imatinib to make it a better wrapper of this dehydron, and then uh, I, in that way I would ensure that I'll be able to tell apart LCK from KIT, and hence create a drug that doesn't have the immunosuppression. So this is the way you really proceed you actually have to digitalize this information. And because you are dealing with paralogs, uh, this, is the, um, this is the dehydron matrix, as it were. So at entry ij, you have a colored entry. If i and j residues are paired by a dehydron, and gray if they are paired by a, by a normal hydrogen bond, and nothing if they are not paired by a hydrogen bond at all, right? So you can actually compare the wrappings of these different targets by simply in this sort of digital form. Um, and, uh, and so and you can create a library of closely related paralogs in order to be able to manipulate specificity according to the, to the differences in the wrapping patterns across paralogs. So here is a dehydron. It's a well-wrapped hydrogen bond in Abelson, a well-wrapped hydrogen bond in LCK, hence a possible candidate for higher specificity, right? And so here is in a, in a cartoon. So you see these are two dehydrons, A and B in, speech, in protein 1. Only A is pre present in protein 2, but not in protein 3. So if you target it with a wrapping design and aim at stabilizing A, then chances are you're going to have cross-reactivity between 1 and 2, but not in 3. If you target B, on the other hand, you're only going to get cross-reactivity for 1, but not for 2 and 3. Right? So that's the idea behind it. So that's, that's how you use your filter for selectivity in a digital manner. There's a, an extra twist to the story. When we look at Jun K, Jun K in the wild type doesn't even have a dehydron there. It has nothing there. It's an open loop. Why? This region is so underwrapped, it doesn't even form a hydrogen bond, 
right? I mean, if you have less than seven, you, you don't, you never find a hydrogen bond with less than seven nonpolar groups in the in the in the microenvironment around it. So, if it, I mean, why seven? It's an it's another story. But um, it's, so this is so poorly wrapped this loop that is not even the hydrogen bond is not even there. But when you bring in grease here, you can actually induce it. So if we, if instead of using imatinib, you would use imatinib with a methyl here, then you would actually induce the bond, and uh, and and so that's that's a case of controlled induced folding that can actually be used to achieve specificity. Uh, so the story is very clear now. We have to put a methyl there, okay, to wrap this guy, which is unique to Kit and to Junke. And, and to PDGFR, and in nowhere else to be found, in none of the other targets. So in that way, we are going to actually enhance the specificity in a way that is going to curb the, the potential side effect, especially cardiotoxicity of the parental compound. Right? So I went to Bill Borman and Seng Hong Peng from uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center and asked them to, well, took them to dinner and cajoled them with some money and so forth, and told them that I, to, I, I wanted this <coughs> compound to be made. So this is, remember, a modification of imatinib, only differs from the parental compound in one methyl, and I claim that this is not going to be cardiotoxic and is going to retain all the anti-cancer activity of the parental compound. Sounds like science fiction, but I'll show you it works. So this is called WBC, so from Bill Borman and Seng Hong Peng, attempt number four. And we can talk about the three early attempts that failed, but that's another story. And we only so so here is a compound we made WBC4. Again, the first in a methyl on imatinib, and this is the first test. So here is the uh, cell growth assay on gastrointestinal stromal tumor cells, which are highly kit dependent, <coughs> and you see an equivalent uh, reaction. An, an equivalent level of inhibition of cell growth for both our compound and imatinib, the commercial name is Glivec. So it's also known as Glivec. Now, here's the first surprise. When you look at chronic myeloleukemia cell, uh, which, which is an uh, 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 Abelson-dependent cell line, this is the first difference. You don't see virtually any inhibition of cell growth for when you use our compound as compared to what happens when you use Glivec or Imatinib, you see. So this is the first hint that we may be achieving specificity. So then uh, uh, this is a, uh, a much more convincing test. So here you have the, cell, the cellular assay for the gastrointestinal stromal tumor cell with our compound, the wrapping redesign, and imatinib, and you see a comparable inhibitory activity over the phosphorylation of the kit kinase, right? Uh, now, when you look at the chronic myeloleukemia cell, there you see for Abelson, it's very different, right? Our compound doesn't touch it. We don't touch Abelson, right? We only differ in one methyl, but we don't touch Abelson, and Glivec or imatinib, of course, knocks down significantly the uh, activity of the Abelson kinase. It, in, it impairs its phosphorylation significantly, right? So we have, we claim, based on this assay, that we may have achieved specificity, but is that enough to prove that we can really curb a side effect? Okay, so this is another assay. So we gave it, we gave our compound and the prototype to uh, Ambit Corporation in uh, San Diego, California, that can do extensive kinetic assays, and this is what we got. So here are uh, it's a good portion of the human kinome, and there's another slide that shows the rest. So it's not the entire human kinome, but it's a good cross-section of it, up at least 250 or 60 kinases out of the 512 and, and 19 that we have. And so here is the Abelson manifold, Abelson and some drug-resistant mutations of Abelson. And you see, our activity is uh, sub-micromolar, whereas, uh, excuse me, micromolar, whereas uh, 
Imaginative activity on Abelson is typically in the nanomolar range, which, uh, and as you know, this, this activity is the culprit of the cardiotoxicity of imatinib. So we pretty much believe we have reduced it to significant levels because the affinity is only in the micromolar range, which is not of pharmacological significance. Uh, but what's more interesting, we don't touch LCK, right? Here is the LCK band for, uh, for imatinib, and there's no red here. We don't, we don't really have any activity on LCK. We have comparable activity on KIT. And surprise, surprise, we touch JUNK. Remember, this had a protective role on the heart. So we, we can actually get that uh, by the wrapping engineering of, of imatinib. And the wild type, uh, excuse me, the parental drug doesn't touch JUNK, right? And so, so we achieve pretty much all we wanted, right? We touch kit to the same extent <coughs> as, as uh, imatinib. We hardly touch Abelson, which helps us prevent cardiotoxicity. And we touch Junke, which had a protective role on the heart, uh, by inducing a dehydron where there isn't any. And we don't touch LCK, therefore our drug is not expected to be immunosuppressive. And as for PDGFR, we have nothing to say. It's not in the PDB, although we can construct a homology model based on KIT. It is close proximity. We touch it to the same extent as the parental drug, and that's okay, because we want it to, in fact, have an anti-angiogenic activity, and we do. So now, in regards to the, uh, to the side effects, so here you have uh, uh, the cardiomyocyte uh, of so we needed, a, of course, a cardiomyocytes, and we needed to show that imatinib or Glivec actually turn on the pathway that is transduced through JUNK and eventually leads to mitochondrial depolarization. And sure enough, the bands are there. So this means that this pathway has been activated, whereas our compound hardly touches it. In fact, this shows the inhibitory activity on JUNK phosphorylation.